Okay, the first short talk of the afternoon, uh, Zoltan Balash, Balash on uh, sandboxing, sandbox detection, actually. You have the floor. Hi, everyone. Uh, you have to know that this is a 45 minutes presentation compressed into 20 minutes. So fasten your seatbelts because we will travel with uh, hyperspeed. Uh, this slide is dedicated uh, about cyber to cyber Peter, cyber Kleisner, cyber, cyber. And uh, these are the things uh, I have done. Uh, these are my researches, but we don't have time for this. This is the company I work for. And um, show me your hands. Uh, how many of you tried to analyze malware in a malware analysis sandbox, but it failed to run? <coughs> hands up. OK, great. Uh, how many of you guys tried to ever write malware and uh, try to bypass the malware analysis sandboxes? OK, great. And uh, how many of you tried to create a new malware analysis sandbox, like the guys from Checkpoint? OK. <laughs> or uh, how many of you are uh, into buying a new malware analysis sandbox to protect your company, for example? OK, great. So this presentation is for you. Uh, as you all have known, uh, this, uh, the current number analysis trends are that uh, there is static analysis, there is dynamic analysis, and there is manual analysis. The static and dynamic ones can be automated. The manual cannot be automated. Uh, it is very easy to be bypass the static and the dynamic analysis. It is very hard to bypass a good manual analyst, but uh, if there are 400,000 new malware samples every day, then uh, you can also bypass uh, the manual analysts. So uh, what are my problems with these malware analysis sandboxes? Uh, these were very great tools uh, in the hands of malware analysts, and uh, this was just one way of detecting uh, new unknown malware on the network. But the problem is that nowadays these uh, sandboxes are sold to companies, and uh, they usually lack the resources, skills, or people to uh, know how to interpret the reports from these magic sandboxes, which say that they will detect every new advanced uh, persistent threats on your network. Um, nowadays, uh, it is pretty common to uh, do sandbox detection in uh, ev almost every malware. But uh, in the past, they have focused way too much on uh, detecting uh, virtualization systems. And uh, it's kind of good, but I think it's right nowadays a little bit outdated. Most of the techniques are uh, flagged as malicious or they are uh, circumvented or simulated or whatever. So these are not the best ways to detect sandboxes anymore if you write a new malware. And um, in these screenshots on the left, you can see that I have created a new red sample. I have uh, ticked all the anti-analysis checkboxes on this, sam on this uh, red sample. And I ran it on a system which was protected uh, by a special uh, defensive software. And uh, this software tried to emulate uh, the desktop machine as it is a virtualized uh, environment. So first of all, the malware detected this as it's virtualized, so it quit. So it didn't infect the real user workstation. And on the other hand, the binary was flagged as malicious. So this is not the best way nowadays to do sandbox detection. So I have uh, created a new malware, and I have uploaded it uh, to the publicly available sandboxes and some of the private ones I had access to. And uh, my malware can extract information from these malware analysis sandboxes. I implemented both uh, known methods, and uh, I have created new ideas to detect uh, these sandboxes. And um, the easiest way to extract uh, data from this malware analysis sandbox if I have direct HTTP connection to the internet, so I can leak every data to my server. 
Uh, there are some sandboxes which uh, block direct connection to the internet, but they still try to resolve the domain names to IP addresses. So for example, if uh, my malware tries to connect, Microsoft Office is installed on this box dot mydomain.com, and I operate the DNS server for mydomain.com, I, I can know for sure that uh, on this sandbox, Microsoft Office was installed because I get the data through DNS tunneling. And uh, last but not least, I can also use the report, whether it's publicly available or someone who operates this sandbox can send it to me and uh, I can hide this information in the report, like creating new files or something like that. But uh, let me show you it in action, how it really looks like. So here what you can see that uh, I upload my malware to this uh, very good free uh, online sandbox called Malware. It uses Cuckoo. And uh, it's a really good service. I use it time to time. And um, here you can see that uh, my server is waiting for the new connections. And uh, for example, you can see that uh, this uh, malware analysis sandbox is using uh, pretty old and small screen resolution. You can see what uh, that, um, for example, it is uh, running on VirtualBox. You can see that it is a Xeon-based processor, and so on and so on. So you can leak an awful lot of different information. Here you can see that uh, the mouse event was emulated, so it there were between different times, the mouse position was different, and so on and so on. So you can get a lot of uh, interesting data from these sandboxes. But uh, when I checked uh, the report for uh, the results of my malware, I was able to see that uh, where my malware was connecting by leaking all the data. And uh, you can see soon that uh, it was also flagged as malicious because I have already implemented old known techniques to detect sandboxes. And uh, this Cuckoo sandbox was detecting it that I try to detect it. Okay, so uh, in the next slides, I'm going to show you some of the tricks I have used in my malware. And whenever you see this uh, red, uh, big red uh, thing, it means that uh, this trick has a good sandbox detection effectiveness. It's a small, it's not a very effective way to detect sandboxes. And when you see a trap and it's big, it means that uh, this technique can be easily flagged as malicious or it is already flagged as malicious in a lot of times. But if it's a small trap, then uh, you as an attacker know that uh, this is a good way to detect sandboxes because your malware won't be flagged as malicious. The first one was the screen resolution. And here you can see a statistics from a browser a statistics company. And as you can see, it's uh, around 7% uh, of the users on the internet who are using uh, 1,024 square, 768 screen resolution or lower. But uh, let's see the sandboxes. 43% uh, used uh, this kind of resolution and 36% uh, used the uh, uh, and 600 resolution, which is a big problem, but there was even some one sandbox with 640. And I mean, it's, they didn't even try to hide. This is a malware analysis sandbox. I have checked what kind of software is installed on this sandbox, which is usually not seen on uh, usual uh, user desktops. And uh, the best one uh, I have seen was this uh, we Work tools. And the story behind this is that uh, there are some malware which automatically checks for the presence of VMware tools. And uh, the sandbox developer thought that it is a great idea to rename the VMware tools to VEVR tools. 
These are very common processes you can find on malware analysis sandboxes, but they are not very common on user desktops. Uh, one of my favorite techniques is the check for the processor type, because uh, usually people don't care to fake it. And uh, for example, if you are an exploit kit operator, you know for sure that you are targeting desktop users or notebooks or something like that. And if you see that the processor type is uh, some uh, eight core processor, something uh, specialized for servers like Xeon processors or Opteron ones, then you can be sure that this is not your target, but this is a sandbox. And I have seen some very old processors as well, like Intel Pentium 2 and Intel Pentium Pro. I have no idea what that was. But uh, there were some sandboxes which uh, used uh, or at least faked real desktop processors like Intel Atom or Intel Core processors. Uh, it is again a well-known way to detect sandboxes, uh, at least among penetration testers, to check for the number of cores of the processor. And uh, it turned out that uh, it works, but not every time. Uh, for example, I have seen uh, one sandbox from Ukraine which used four cores, or at least it faked it. I have also checked uh, for the computer system. And if you see, for example, box, then you can be sure that this is not a real user workstation. And uh, in my uh, research, I have found that almost 70% of these sandboxes were using some kind of virtualized environment. Uh, almost 20 was some which looked like a desktop, but I'm sure they just faked it. And uh, around uh, 14 was uh, something which looked like a server. I have also checked the mouse movement, whether it's simulated that there is a user moving the mouse during the analysis. And uh, it was pretty shocking to see that uh, only 20% simulated the mouse movements, and there were some uh, very basic uh, positions on the screen where the mouse was used, so uh, that was kind of shocking. I have also checked the memory size, because nowadays I'm not sure that a lot of people uh, use computers with one gigabyte of memory. You can even start YouTube with it. But uh, still, an awful lot of sandboxes use the uh, low amount of memory, mostly because of uh, the effectiveness. And if, they ha if you have to run multiple sandboxes, multiple virtualized environments in parallel, then uh, you have to keep short your memory assignments. But again, there were still some uh, good sandboxes which used 4 gigabyte of memory. Uh, just for fun, I have checked for the machine name. And I have found some interesting strings there. For example, someone named his sandbox to sandbox A or VenXP Maltest. Well, this is not the best idea, but uh, most of them were quite random. Uh, this is an actual real screenshot from one of the malware analysis sandboxes. And I want to ask you to shout some of the tips for me why this is a ma real malware analysis sandbox and not a user desktop. Sorry? No <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing is installed. Yes. Louder, please. Sorry? Yeah, there is no applications running exactly. Yeah, default background. No one uses that. Yeah, it's Windows XP. <laughs> yes. Trash bin is empty, so there are so many things on this picture. Again, this is another malware analysis sandbox uh, with debug data. Another malware analysis sandbox with debug data. Pretty interesting. But when you look at a real user workstation, this is how it looks like. Actually, I stole this screenshot from the hacked team torrent file, where one of the administrators of hacking team was hacked, and uh, the guy who attacked them stole the screenshots while he was busy working. <laughs> so if you see this, you can be sure. This is a real user desktop. There's, there's no question about this. 
I have also checked uh, for the number of flash drives used in uh, the sandboxes. Usually it was zero, but there were some cases where only one flash drive has been used. So if you want to detect sandboxes via this way, I recommend to set the threshold to two because none of the sandboxes have used two flash drives, but I have never seen any user desktop with only two flash drives used. Uh, again, this is one of my favorites, checking for printers. None of the sandboxes have printers installed except the default ones like the Windows, the Adobe, or the Office ones. But all user workstations and desktop has a printer. I've also checked for the number of recently created or modified files in uh, common directories like desktop, documents, folders, app data, temp, and so on. Uh, it was not a surprise that uh, almost all sandboxes had a really low value on these, but if you check a real user workstation, you will see a lot of recently modified files in these directories. Now, if you are implementing uh, all these sandbox detection techniques in your malware, there are at least four levels where you can do that. The first level is in JavaScript. If you are into exploit kit development, uh, you can still check for some things in JavaScript, for example, the screen resolution. You can also uh, make automated decisions in your malware, hard-coded, which is good because via the dynamic analysis, you won't leak your CNC server data. But again, this is not uh, something uh, super sophisticated, so not everything can be implemented here. Or you can do another way that you leak uh, some uh, data to your CNC server, and the logic on the CNC server decides whether it's your target or not. Or uh, last but not least, you can, for example, leak screenshots to your CNC server and check three different screenshots whether it is your target or not. But the best approach is to implement all of these layers and uh, quit or modify your behavior at the first layer when you detect the, your sandbox. There are also some hard problems for malware analysis sandbox developers. For example, when it comes to they uh, emulate the sleep functions or not. It turned out that uh, in my ca test cases, most of the sandboxes never even tried to emulate the sleep calls. So if you implement a four minute sleep in your malware, you will just skip the uh, behavior analysis. Uh, but it is very easy to detect uh, whether sleep is emulated or not. For example, by uh, creating new threads, and one thread sleeps, the other creates some heavy calculations like hashes, and based on which uh, thread uh, finishes uh, f sooner, you know whether sleep is simulated or not. And there is no desktop on the world where sleep is simulated, so it's, again, for sure you know that this is a sandbox. There is a solution to solve that called continuous sandboxing, which I don't have time to tell you how it works, but unfortunately it has own own problems as well. Another hard problem is the network connection, whether it's simulated, whether there is a real connection, or there is no connection at all. No matter which uh, way you choose in your sandbox, uh, you can be detected. So th this, these are very hard problems. And uh, my lessons learned for this presentation is that if you are a malware writer, there are many, many ways uh, how you can uh, bypass static and dynamic analysis. And uh, if you are a sandbox developer, especially if you are one selling your sandbox to customers for uh, a lot of money, then uh, I think you should really try harder because uh, nowadays the level is not what uh, I would expect from these sandboxes. And if you are on the blue team or defensive side, you should really test your sandboxes against uh, these anti-sandbox solutions. And what I really recommend to customize your sandboxes so it really matches your uh, desktop environment. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. So we, we have time just for one question. Over there.
over there. Over there. I cannot tell you. The question was, <coughs> what is the best sandbox out there? But I can't tell you. But if you pay me, I can tell you. <laughs> OK, well, that's the first try. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.